Welcome to the Mequon Nature Preserve. Today we're going to take you on a habitat hike and explore five different types of ecosystems we have here on the preserve. We're going to look at streams, ephemeral ponds, wetlands, forests, and prairie. Let's go! I'm standing here on the newly restored Trinity Creek. Trinity Creek was previously running through a channelized ditch and now we've restored it back to its historic location of a meandering stream. The meandering stream creates a lot, slows down the water and creates a lot of habitat opportunities for other creatures here in the creek. We also will be planting uh, thousands of native trees and shrubs and native plants along the stream bank here coming this spring to help with erosion and add diversity and to this wonderful habitat. Speaking of habitat, if you look behind me, you can see the rocks and logs um, that are in this creek channel. Those are not there to, to start with. We, we purposely place those within the stream channel to create um, micro habitats within the stream bed. Um, behind these and in front of these, we create um, pools and riffles. The riffles are in front of it, in front of these logs and rocks, which um, allow for oxygen to be infiltrated into the water column. Behind these logs and rocks, we, we have pools. Those pools are slow moving water that allow for invertebrate and fish species to take shelter um, out of the strong moving current. One of the fish species um, that are important and need these, these ecosystems, these stream ecosystems, um, are northern pike. One of their main, um, their spawning, their main spawning seasons early spring when we have high water levels. Um, these streams will actually attract these the female pike and male pike to swim up, swim up these shallow streams. Um, and this is actually prime spawning habitat for, for large northern pike that can reach up to three to four feet in length. Not only will these logs and rock structures create habitat for, for animals that need these, um, but they also help with catching a lot of our sediment and runoff that enters into these stream systems, um, allowing for the sediment to build up behind that, preventing it from flowing downstream into the Milwaukee River and eventually into Lake Michigan. What are the benefits of a slow-moving meandering stream compared to a fast-moving channelized stream? This is a prairie ecosystem. What makes a prairie a prairie uh, is that there are very few trees um, within that ecosystem. Um, mostly prairies are made up of grasses and forbs. Prairies are actually very diverse. Uh, there are usually over 100 different species of plants um, inside a prairie. Um, prairies are a very important ecosystem. They take up a lot of carbon. They're what's known as a carbon sink. So they, they take up carbon out of the atmosphere, especially at a time when we are putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere through emissions. Um, prairies take that carbon out of the air and put it into their root systems. A lot of these, these plants have very deep root systems. Some, some prairie plants can get roots down to 14 feet below the soil. Not only are prairies diverse for plant species, but they also have a, a vast diversity of animal species. So these plants provide cover for rabbits and many other rodents, uh, mice. They also provide food uh, from the plants themselves and the seeds. And then in turn, those mammals provide food for a lot of predatory birds. You'll see a lot of uh, hawks flying over, uh, scanning the area for, uh, for their next meal. Um, not only uh, are mammals and uh, birds here, but there is a very, very large biomass of insects. In fact, there's there's more biomass here of insects and invertebrates than there are of all the other species here. Uh, one acre of prairie alone can hold up to a million spiders. So there are a lot of uh, six-legged creatures running around in this area. The, the prairie is basically the forest for the bugs. Prairies did not inhabit much of southeastern Wisconsin. We do have a few prairies here to show what the what the, the tall grass prairie used to look like um, in the western part of the state and west of Wisconsin. Um, but here at the at, at Mequon Nature Preserve, we actually use prairies as, as a, 
a sort of a cover crop for our restoration efforts. Prairies grow um, pretty quickly. So we use these to um, cover a lot of our farm fields before our restoration and tree planting. Um, trees grow pretty slow. So our prairies are able to hold that soil and um, hold diversity there um, while our trees and our, our mesic forests uh, continue to grow. One of the things that also makes a prairie a prairie and allows for a vast expanse of grasses and forbs and not a lot of trees is um, the use of fire. Um, fire used to be prominent on the landscape. In these ecosystems, um, fires used to sweep through vast expanses of these every three to four years. Um, so to mimic that here at the preserve, we actually do prescribed fires um, on a rotation every three to five years we actually light this area on fire, um, which sets back a lot of the plant growth um, and sets back a lot of if there were any tree species that were encroaching on these on these prairie ecosystems. Um, that'll actually kill those tree species and, and benefit a lot of the grasses and forbs, allowing them to grow stronger and healthier. The question for this section is, what are the benefits of a prescribed fire on the prairie ecosystem? I'm standing here in Paul's Pond. Paul's Pond is actually one of our largest wetlands. A drain tile was broken back in 2005. So this whole field used to be a soybean field, but then water quickly started to form back just within 24 hours after breaking the drain tile. Wetlands are a very important ecosystem, not only for uh, animals and plants, but also for humans. Many different animal species call a wetland home. If you look at a wetland, you'll find different invertebrates, turtles, frogs, bird species, and even fish. Um, we, also, we have a variety of hen houses and duck houses that we do build here for the animals. Another creature that calls a wetland home are the prairie crayfish. And actually, Paul's Pond, this little wetland right here, this is where the first prairie crayfish crayfish was found here at the Mequon Nature Preserve. A cool thing about them is that they create these things called mud chimneys. When you walk by, you're going to see kind of like a little pile of mud with a hole in it. Some people think it's a snake house, but actually it's a home for these crayfish. What they do is they kind of hang out in there during the heat of the day, and at night they kind of emerge out and they start walking around and looking for things to eat. Another fun fact about this wetland is where this is where the, we had a first pair of nesting sandhill cranes. They live right over here, and they nested right over here, and they actually had two little fledglings. And actually, we actually saw them, they're coming back um, for another round of nesting. Wetlands are also good for humans for a variety, variety of reasons. Uh, they're great flood control. So when it rains a lot, they, what they do is they act like a sponge. They soak up a lot of the water, and it slowly releases the water into a river and downstream, so it doesn't all go at once. It just goes nice and slow. They also are good at um, picking up pollutants in the water. Uh, so that's why it's like it's a good um, for lots of organisms to live in it because all the pollutants will go away because the plants that live in these wetlands will soak them all up. Your question for this section is why wetlands are important in stormwater management for both rural and urban settings. So this is Pat's Pond. Uh, this is an ephemeral pond. An ephemeral pond has two main characteristics. Uh, the first being that there is no permanent standing water. Uh, at some, uh, some point during the year, the water does go away. And so uh, the second main characteristic that follows that is that there are not fish in here. Uh, this is a unique habitat though for other creatures that wouldn't be able to coexist with fish, uh, being that they can be aggressive predators. Uh, two great examples uh, in this pond would be uh, the larval uh, stage of our tiger salamanders. So tiger salamanders are amphibians, so just like frogs, they grow up uh, in water and then they come out on land. Our tiger salamanders are actually the largest terrestrial um, salamander that we have in this area. Uh, they, uh, meaning terrestrial meaning they are largest on land. We also have fairy shrimp that uh, live in here and they are a very uh, passive creature that just uh, floats casually, so they would not be able to compete with something as fast uh, as a fish. On top of that, an ephemeral pond wouldn't be very good habitat for things, uh, top predators such as bullfrogs. So, you know, in the south, a bullfrog can develop in a year because of the habitat 
it's much warmer there year round and with food availability. But here in Wisconsin, it gets cold for many months. Uh, the tadpoles take multiple years to develop before they become an adult. So an ephemeral pond drying up is no good for uh, a tadpole. These are actually really good habitats for all of our oatnits and other macroinvertebrates, oatnits being our dragonflies and damselflies. A lot of the insects that you see flying around in the summer, in the spring, uh, and even throughout the winter, uh, this is their nursery. They grow up in here, so they are uh, hanging out underwater. All the leaf litter that is in here, it is really, really good habitat for them. They need that to stay warm. It provides a food source for um, a lot of the, herb the herbivore macroinvertebrates, which then are eaten by things such as dragonflies. All the trees that are around here, you see, these are ash trees. They are taking up anywhere from 120 gallons or just 60 gallons of water uh, a day. And so that really helps the actual action of being ephemeral is because they're taking up so much water. With the introduction of the beetle known as the emerald ash borer, we've lost a lot of our ash trees throughout Wisconsin. And so all of our ash trees here have now unfortunately passed away and we're seeing a lot more water stay here because they are not soaking it up. Uh, and that's caused a, a big change in the water um, absorption in many of the ephemeral ponds across the state. Pass Pond is also a site of a lot of our monitoring programs, uh, especially our uh, tiger salamander monitoring. Uh, we're very interested in tiger salamanders because being amphibians, uh, they are uh, an indicator species. Uh, an indicator species is one that we use to gauge the health of a habitat. If you ever heard the term like canary in a coal mine, miners would use the canary to tell them if the area they were in is safe. Uh, the same way we use indicator species to tell us if the environment is healthy or not. Uh, they have a skin that is very absorbent. They use it to actually uh, breathe and drink water through it. Our skin is a much more powerful barrier. But because of this, that means they also have no say in what their skin absorbs. So any type of pollutants or toxins that are here, they're gonna absorb that whether they like it or not. So if we have a species like that here, that tells us that we don't have any bad things that are affecting them. These are ever-changing and fragile environments that are home to specialist species that rely on them, which is why we take great care uh, to protect them. Your question for this section is, what makes an ephemeral pond important and how is it different from a wetland? We're here in, standing in the middle of Harvey's Woods here at the Mequon Nature Preserve. Centuries ago, southeastern Wisconsin was covered in this traditional maple, beech, and basswood forest. And this is what we have here at Harvey's Woods. Harvey's Woods is our blueprint forest on how we want to reforest majority of the 444 acres here at Mequon Nature Preserve. Harvey's Woods has over 443 spe different species of plant life here. Um, it's incredibly diverse, and this is why it's so important. As Jamie mentioned earlier, we saw the devastation that emerald ash borer had on the ash trees here in southeastern Wisconsin and how it had an impact, a negative impact, on our woodlots. The, the great thing about uh, this di amount of diversity here in Harvey's Woods is that it had a very minimal impact because we had so much diversity. We did have emerald ash come through here and we did have a loss of ash trees but it didn't have a great of an impact as it would have if we didn't have a diverse forest like we do here. Harvey's Woods is also home to some very unique plant life here that you don't find typically in a lot of forests here in southeastern Wisconsin. One of the plants I'm standing by right here is leatherwood. Leatherwood is not found in your typical woodlots. Um, it needs very specific soil and light conditions that can be found here in Harvey's Woods. Um, leatherwood was also used by Native Americans to make bowstrings, fishing lines, and other things. So uh, another very useful plant as well. It is also home to many macroinvertebrates that find their home here in the leaf litter that covers the forest floor here in Harvey's Woods. Other creatures that find homes here are, are birds, owls, deer, and other mammals find this a great habitat. There's plenty of diverse cover here. We have a great understory, a different heights of plants and different layers of plants to provide cover for during the winter months, also provide other food sources for them as well. Um, so again, diversity is really important and that's what we strive to when we're managing some of our woodlots um, here at the Mequon Nature Preserve. Your question for this is, why is diversity so important when managing a forest ecosystem? 
Well, that concludes our tour, our habitat hike of the Mequon Nature Preserve. I hope you all have a better understanding of the five ecosystems that we talked about and why it's so important that we're in the process of restoring those ecosystems to southeastern Wisconsin.